Um, so first off, thank you for uh, listening to a dirty engineer up here. Um, I, I've been, but I've, I'm fascinated by all the stuff that you guys do, and I, it's been really fun being here, and uh, I love working on this stuff. So thanks for uh, listening. I want to talk today about a problem that, uh, that I've had a lot of fun working on over the last few months. Um, so just to kind of remind everybody of what we're doing here, um, I'm sure everybody knows, but the, the big idea is we're going to build a really lightweight uh, light sail spacecraft, deploy it in Earth orbit, and then shoot it with a really big ground-based laser uh, for a couple of minutes to try to get it up to about 20% of the speed of light, hopefully in the direction of Alpha Centauri, right? Um, so for me as an engineer who deals with uh, control and stability and things like that, when I see this video, the first thing I think about is how do you keep the sail on this beam for that two minutes? And I think a not too far off uh, dynamic analogy for this is, uh, can I hover this sheet of paper over my head by blowing on it? So should we do the experiment? Uh, let's see. <laughs> right. So um, you could argue that uh, maybe I'm just not very good at that. Maybe we need a better control system. But I think that uh, in this situation, um, doing actually doing active feedback control would be extremely difficult. Uh, because of the distances involved and the, the time, right? The, the delay time is going to make it such that we can't, probably can't close a, a stabilizing feedback loop around this. Okay, so uh, I think as a result, we need to look for something that's passively stable. And uh, I guess let's dive into that. Um, so I promise there won't be too much math. It'll be, it'll be nice. Uh, so um, to sort of set the stage and I, I pull back the curtain a little bit and tell you what the assumptions are behind all this, uh, we're looking at a a perfectly reflective, rigid body sail, which is you know, not, not the case, obviously, in real life, but I think this gets us some insight. Um, and we're looking at a beam that's about the same size as the sail. And basically, what we're trying to do is just integrate up, add up all of the, uh, the flux on the sail and add up the forces and torques, right? So in these equations, P is the, uh, the beam power flux on the sail, B is the beam axis, N is the, the normal vector, and we're just going to plug these things into F equals MA and Euler's equation. So putting on the engineer hat for a minute uh, and thinking about this from a design standpoint, there's a couple knobs we can turn in these equations, right? So the first one is P. We can shape the beam and put power in different places. And the other thing we can do is uh, shape the sail itself, right? So that's N. So we have two knobs we can turn. We can, we can mess with the beam power profile and the shape of the sail. OK. so. Uh, and the, the goal, of course, right, is to shape these things such that the thing is stable. So next, what do we mean by stable? Uh, so when we typically, uh, when we think about stability, it's in reference to an equilibrium point. So we think about the dynamics of the sail flying on this laser beam. Uh, it's constantly accelerating, so there is no equilibrium point. So what do we do? Well, um, we're going to make ourselves an equilibrium point by taking a slice through the beam at the sail and kind of projecting ourselves down into this sort of transverse uh, set of coordinates, right? And just look at the dynamics there. So now if we look at this slice, what we want, if we want this thing to be stable on the beam is for this sort of equal, we want a stable equilibrium point in the middle of the beam. And intuitively what we mean by stable here is we want this thing to look like a simple harmonic oscillator around the middle of the beam, sort of like it has a spring hooked up to it that's pulling it back towards the middle. And that second thing is just how you write that down in math. Um, okay, so this is what we're after. Uh, so first off, uh, I want to take a look at Conical sails on a Gaussian beam. So the, the reason for this is this was kind of the nominal architecture that was originally proposed for Starshot. Um, so we've got a cone-shaped thing. Uh, it's got some angle alpha, the kind of cone angle. And um, we're going to look at kind of this, this transverse motion, right? Uh, so if we, if we plug into those integrals and chug through all the math a little bit, uh, you can get to this picture. So this is uh, for a non-spinning sail. I guess I should back up a second and, and also point to this omega vector here. So maybe, it, maybe it's a good idea, this was suggested too, that we spin this thing up and maybe there's some kind of gyroscopic magic that, that will happen and make things nice for us. So we're, we're not going to do that for now. This is non-spinning. But what you get uh, if you plug through the, those equations, um, in terms of the, the sail parameters, so this is the, that cone angle on the x-axis, and what's on the y-axis here is the position of the center of mass measured down from the tip of the cone, normalized by the sail radius. So what this tells you is that if you want it to be stable, you actually have to place the center of mass below the base of the cone. So there's no way we could build just a simple cone, you know, putting mass in different places that would work. We actually have to have something like, uh, like 
pendulum sail here to, to make this actually work. We have to put the mass below the base of the cone somehow. So maybe this can work, uh, but I think there's some difficult you know, trade-offs here. One is that this is gonna add extra mass. Um, you're gonna have to have some kind of stiff structure that can, can hold this thing together, right? So that could be problematic. The other thing is that this pendulum mass is gonna have to be in the beam, which is maybe a difficult thermal environment. Uh, okay, so, so that's one option. Let's take another look then at this, this spinning idea. What happens if we spin this thing? Can we maybe spin it up really fast and avoid having to have that pendulum mass? Uh, so it, if you look at the simplified kind of linearized picture that I kind of showed you at first, it looks like this might work, but there's something a little more subtle going on. Um, and it's, it's pretty intuitive if you know what gyroscopic precession looks like. So if we spin this thing up, um, the, uh, the angular momentum vector is fixed in inertial space. And the argument for doing this is usually, right, so what happens when you have precession is the angular velocity is gonna move around this angular momentum vector in kind of a coning motion, right, in like a, a little circle. And this, this idea is used on things like sounding rockets to kind of average out perturbations. The idea is that if you spin it really fast, these perturbations will kind of average out over one of these precession periods, uh, you know, along, and everything will average out along that angular momentum vector and things will work out. There's a key subtlety here, though, that's missing. So if, if you have this angular momentum vector lined up perfectly with the beam axis, that'll happen. If you tilt it just a little bit off the beam axis and think about what happens if you average over the precession period, you're gonna get a component pushing you sideways off the beam, right? So there's some sense in which there's like a stability breaking thing going on here where, or sorry, symmetry breaking, where if you tilt this thing a little bit and break that symmetry with the beam axis, uh, it's, it's unstable. So from an engineering standpoint, you're never gonna achieve that kind of perfection and, uh, and it's probably not gonna work super well. Okay, so I thought a lot about this stuff and, and was really looking for other answers to this problem. And there's probably many other answers, but one that, uh, that came up was uh, making a spherical sail. So think of like a shiny, a big shiny ping pong ball or something like that. Uh, what this does immediately is decouple translation and rotation. So uh, you can have this thing tumbling around and it's not gonna affect the kind of Trans, transverse motion at all. Uh, there's a problem with this though, if you just think about it really quickly, uh, this thing on a unimodal beam like that Gaussian, if we just look at what happens with a single ray, if you translate to the side a little bit, you get a force that pushes you further away from the center of that beam. So it's clearly not stable on the kind of Gaussian beam we were looking at before. We have that second knob to turn that we haven't looked at yet. So what happens if we play with the beam shape? Um, and it turns out if you can hollow out the middle of the beam, and this is like one example of this, but there's many other possibilities you could imagine. Uh, you could imagine something like a donut shape or whatever, but if you remove power from the middle and put a bunch more power in the sides, uh, you can imagine as this thing translates sideways, it's gonna encounter more power in the side of the beam and it's gonna push it back towards the middle. So it turns out this looks pretty good in that linearized picture. It looks like it might work. Um, but of course, that's not the whole story. So thankfully, this is a really simple kind of 2D picture, right? And uh, it's, it's amenable to you know, simple uh, math and some numerical things. And what we can actually do here is numerically compute a potential function for this thing on the middle of the beam. And you can see you get this nice little bowl. And what's going on here, right, is you can imagine this thing kind of just rolling around in this potential well. As long as the energy in the transverse modes of this thing uh, stays below the rim of the bowl, you're gonna stay on the middle of the beam, right? Uh, unfortunately, there's not maybe not, well at least not in this rigid body kind of assumption, there's no damping in this thing. So if you have energy getting pumped in from noise or something else, right, you can imagine there's some kind of exit time associated with this thing where it'll eventually fly out. But this looks promising, right? You might be able to do this. So um, let's see, does it actually work? Um, so there, here's a few simulations. This was like a little ray tracer that I coded up. Um, the first plot on the left just shows what happens if you sort of perturb this off the center uh, its initial conditions and run the thing. And you can see it just oscillates back and forth and it stays, uh, stays on the middle. Um, there's some resonant frequency associated with this though, right? It's like a, a simple harmonic oscillator to first order. So you can imagine there's a, a frequency at which you could excite this thing and pump energy into it and, and push it off the beam. And there's something important in that, right? Is uh, the, the kind of spectrum of the noise associated with the laser matters a lot. And you wanna make sure it's far away from this resonant mode. So the second picture here is, is what happens when you put some noise on it. So this was like uh, white noise at about 1% uh, added to the beam, and you can say it also still stays on there uh, in this kind of noisy case on the sort of time scale associated with the Starshot launch. Um, so I guess to, to sum up a little bit, 
there's clearly a bunch of assumptions baked into this, and there's, there's a lot of modeling that needs to happen, right? We, we need to take into account things like deformation of the sail, right? Elastic effects, vibration, uh, noise from the beam, what the noise actually looks like, which we kind of don't know yet, where the frequency content is. Um, but I think this is, you know, gives us a framework for thinking about this stuff a little bit, and, uh, and hopefully some of you will get interested in this and we can talk about it and think more about it. And uh, that's about it. So I'd like to, you know, take questions and chat a bit. Did you uh, did you experiment with changing the optical properties actively on the on the cone in like a, a steering type of way? Uh, so no, I think there's some really cool ideas though. You could, you could definitely play with the optical properties, right, and do some really interesting things. And uh, Harry Atwater's been thinking about that a little bit. I think there's, I, I'm not sure active control is, is the right way to go, but I think you could certainly come up with alternative geometries where you, you can do a lot with kind of shaping the, the refractive properties and you know, all that kind of good stuff and get interesting things to happen, yeah. Who's up next? I'm not keeping track, all right. So how do we turn that spherical sail into a transmission for getting the data back? That's a really good question that I don't have a really good answer for. Uh, so I think um, just broadly speaking, there's been this idea floating around of trying to turn the sail into some kind of dish uh, to transmit home with. And I think doing that in optical is incredibly hard because it's got to be the surface finish has, has to be, you know, good to a small fraction of a wavelength, and that's like one micron, trying to get this thing to be smooth to a sub-micron level uh, after you know, flying through God knows what for 20 years, I think is extremely difficult, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know how doable that is. I don't wanna go too far there, but it's really hard in general. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, um, it reminds me a lot of my colleagues who work on aerodynamics, and they, they, they tell me that one of the ways they sometimes solve choosing the right design is, is not with a human being, but yeah. with a genetic algorithm to, to play around with these things and find the optimal solution. I wonder if you've thought about using that. Totally, yeah, definitely been thinking about that. That's on the to-do list. Uh, we actually talked about that uh, this Wednesday at the, the Starshot meeting. And yeah, so one of the things I really want to do is take this really simple like ray tracing code that I've used for this and just stick a GA on it and see what it comes up with after a few weeks. Because I think there's definitely, you can, you, know, you can just sitting down thinking to yourself, imagine other topologies that might work, right? Um, so I think there's a combination of kind of heuristic genetic algorithm type methods and just maybe just standard op, you know, gradient-based optimization tools you could throw at this thing. So if you have an, a notional idea for something you think might work, you could throw it in a convention, more conventional optimizer to try to dial in the parameters and, and see if it works. And then more broadly, if you want to kind of explore the, the design space, right, a genetic algorithm I think is definitely uh, something that I, I want to explore, yeah.